Welcome back to another episode of the Pax What She Said podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Maggie Loney, joined as always by Perry Goldstein. And as promised, the very special guest that we alluded to earlier this week, it's Andrew Mertig of the Pack a Day podcast and the Draft Fellows. Andrew, thanks so much for coming back. How are you? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I am honestly feeling a little bit under the weather, but like this is what I was looking forward to today. So excited to talk a little Packers and hopefully bring some optimism back to the conversation. Yeah, it, uh, it is needed. <laughs> it is needed. We we are an optimistic podcast. Any of our like long term listeners know that we will always find a way to look at this team in a positive light. And you know what? This year, there's plenty of positives to talk about. I know that we are coming off of a really brutal loss, and that's fair. And we can look at that brutal loss in its entirety and talk about it. And if you want to listen to Maggie and I do that, we just put out our recap show. However, we are going to talk about this bye week we're going to talk about this season as a whole and i think as a whole there is a lot of good to talk about so positive vibes only yeah well first bit of news before we get into kind of the the recap on the first half of the season preston smith was traded to the steelers in exchange for a seventh round pick Thoughts on that? I mean, I think we we kind of talked about, you know, earlier this week, Perry and I had said if the Packers are going to be buyers, probably a corner or an edge. Didn't know if they would be sellers, but certainly I think the rumor flying around Twitter the last couple weeks, maybe even months, had been that Preston Smith could be the one out the door if an edge needed team came calling. And the Steelers certainly did. And now the Packers, you know, clear up some of their their cap space for the next couple seasons. And Preston Smith out the door. How do we feel about the depth in the room and just that trade in general? I I would say like Preston Smith was always going to be a difficult fit in a four three, uh, just because of his play style. I don't think he came out and performed super well. Love Preston. To me, he has been the most valuable addition of that giant four person free agent class from years ago. He is going to always be a Packer in in heart, but I loved I loved that he's going to get an opportunity to play in Pittsburgh, where I think he's going to fit in really really well with that scheme. I think he's going to be great as a rotational edge rusher given that group. And for the Packers, I would have liked to see a minor move, maybe use some of the cap space for this year, like that that couple million dollars that they freed up to acquire something, but it didn't pan out that way. So I guess the way that I'm looking at it is this is going to give more opportunities to LVN and Anibare, and hopefully we we see something really productive out of those two. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think on paper it makes perfect sense to your point. Um, cap space wise, you know, they're going to clear his 2024 um, because Pittsburgh is taking on his whole contract. Um, his salary cap starts to grow exponentially next season, 9.8, and then 2026, 18.2. So clearing that off the books is, you know, a good move by Goot. And I guess they feel really confident in the other rotational pieces. And you, I think, have been able to see it more with the snap counts. His snap counts have been going down and some of the other guys have been going up. And we saw you know, it was five snaps, but a great look at Aaron Mosby and they still have Brenton Cox. So um, they have the guys. I agree with you, Andrew, that I think I would have liked a corresponding move, but in my head, it's kind of Preston Smith from Malik Willis with the, with the seventh round pick yeah. swap. So that I guess is the corresponding move, if you will. Um, but but to like the broader point, and I know this is like, this is a business and it's a business decision. It's a decision for the team. Like Preston has been just like such a pro and he's so quietly become um, such a beloved vet player in, in this room. And he was a quieter addition to your point of those four that were added that year that Goot took over. Uh, but he's now been with the team for like six what is six seasons um, signed two contract extensions, like really solid member. So going to be missed for sure, but Pittsburgh's getting a great player. Yeah, I definitely thought that as well. You know, he kind of felt like one of those guys when they gave him the multiple contract ex extensions that he could be like a Packer that retires a Packer, which is so rare nowadays. Um, so unfortunately not going to be the case for him, but excited, like you guys said, to see him back in a three, four and get some, some probably, you know, better opportunities rushing alongside a guy like TJ Watt. But 
hopefully, yes, for sure, LVN kind of ascends into the first round pick that we all hoped that he could become in his soft season. You guys mentioned Aaron Mosby last week had a half sack. Brenton Cox is on the roster. Saw someone else mention a guy like Jamin Davis, who they brought in. Um, not yeah. sure, you know, he could factor into that rotation at all. But thought it was a little bit interesting before we kind of dive into you know the the season recap. That Goody said that that potential last roster spot could be used for Marshawn Lloyd to come back from IR. Yeah. You know, is interesting considering the Packers running back room has looked really good. Chris Brooks has looked good. Emmanuel Wilson looks good. So getting to see the rookie Marshawn Lloyd get some opportunities would be nice in the coming weeks here as well. So let's talk about the season. Let's let's talk about the season. What are what are our impressions of uh are the Packers where you thought they'd be? You know, what did you think their record would be maybe this far in the season? Are they meeting expectations? Are they exceeding them? Are they not quite there, you know, to the juggernaut we thought maybe they would be. The, for me, I thought that the Packers were going to have a tougher kind of middle stretch. And we never know, right? Like there's all sorts of surprises, certainly across the NFC uh, that we we don't foresee coming. So the schedule is so much different now than it looked like in June. But I will say from a from a team standpoint, I thought like maybe they'd be five and four, six and three right now. So I think they're very much on track. It always like this is a reactionary fan base, and that's fine because everybody is really passionate. And oftentimes I try to tell people to calm down and they don't want to, and that's fine. It's one of the great things about the Packers, right? Like everybody really, really cares. It's tough going into the bye week to have an ugly loss at home to a division rival, specifically the team that you're chasing. So does this mean the Packers can't win the division? I don't know. They made it so much harder than it would be if they had won. But all things considered, they're in a great spot. I think they are definitely in the driver's seat for a wild card position. And you never know what's going to happen to the Lions down the stretch. You don't know what's going to happen to the Packers. We remember when they jettisoned Rasul last year, it actually kind of spiked the momentum of the defense. And we saw better play, even though they took away one of their better players and a leader in the locker room. So we'll see how this Preston trade sort of is is seen within the locker room. But um, I would expect somebody like Rashawn Gary to take this pretty personally and come out and hopefully look a little bit more like the 52 that, that we've seen before. Overall, the Packers are in a, a, a great position. Like I was looking back, and I'm going to get the exact figures wrong because I didn't write them down. But it's like we know the Chiefs won the last two Super Bowls. They started those seasons roughly like seven and two, eight and three. Before that, it was the Rams. They actually started seven and five. The Buccaneers before that, I think they were also like six and four, seven and five ish. So like this does not disqualify you from winning a Super Bowl you need to get hot at the end of the season. And so I know everybody is going to be all about Detroit in the national media for the next, you know, until they lose. But for the Packers, they're setting themselves up, get in the tournament, get healthy to be in the tournament, be playing your best ball. Then I'm perfectly comfortable with where they're at right now. I think you said a lot that I agree with. Um, so much that we're going to get to. And I think we are going to do a little bit like of a comparison to last year. It's just so apt when they were going into this moment, you know, three and six versus this year, six and three, just completely different teams. Um, But I think the, uh, the reason why the fan base is maybe a little bit passionate and overzealous at the moment Uh, is because there were just such high expectations for this team going into the season, especially the way they ended their season, right? They ended on that hot run down the stretch into the playoffs. They, everyone remembers the juggernaut offense, beating the Cowboys, dropping like almost a 50 burger on them. And so when you end your season that way, everyone expects you to enter into the next season in that way. And that's just not the reality of the NFL. We've seen a ton of teams this season come out flat, who were great last year and vice versa, right? So teams have tape on you now. You have a new coordinator come in. Jordan Love is in his second season. He's been hurt. Like there are a lot of variables this team is contending with. There are also a lot of things that I think they're doing really well. They're running the ball insanely well. They're one of the best rushing offenses in the league. I've never seen a rush like this, even with Aaron Jones at his like peak powers. So I am not concerned um, 
like to your point, Andrew, they're going to turn it around at the right time. We watched them do it last season. I actually think the loss and the bye week are coming, could be coming at a really fortuitous time for them for two reasons. One is they're so banged up. They need this time. Jordan needs this time. Jair needs this time. Like just everyone needs this time. I'm actually really all for if the, you know, your um, record allows for it, a later buy because you get healthier later down in the season and then you're healthy for that important stretch run. And I think that's what the Packers are going to be able to do this week. Two, now they have to sit with that. They have to sit with that loss against their divisional opponent for an extra week. And then they go into next week, the their following game, against another divisional opponent that they have to beat. Like, I hope that they take this week, they self-scout, they do everything. And I think this is something Matt LaFleur has done an exceptional job at of doing all of that and making those changes and those tweaks and getting that locker room headspace right and come out and be enraged by what they did against the Lions, like the, the egg that they put up. So sorry to the Bears for what they might be potentially, you know, on the receiving end of. Um, because this is, I hope, going to be a Packers team who's like really hot to get back out there and show their opponent and the NFL like that is not who we are. The the performance that we put up is not who we are. They're not performing up, up to expectations because the expectations were really, really, really high. And when you have really high expectations, more than likely, you're going to get disappointed. Um, so I agree with you. I think they're in a great spot. They could potentially go down this run. It's unlikely. I'm going to put it out there, but on, you know, winning the whole way, like go uh, undefeated uh, was the word I was looking for. Their opponents are the bears four and four SF four and four. That's always a tricky one because it's Shanahan Miami. Who's two and six. They don't look like a team. Like I thought that game would be, you know, a big one coming into Lambeau another Detroit. So that'll be the big test. The Seahawks who are four and five. New Orleans, who's two and seven and just fired their head coach. Minnesota, who's six and two right now, but by week 17, who knows where they're going to be. And then Chicago again, four and four. So it's very, very possible that and likely that this team goes the rest of this way with a winning record. And even if even if they drop two of those games that we we know are going to be difficult, right? Like it doesn't matter which two, but we'll say they do. They still finish the season 12 and five. That's going to put you as probably the top wild guard. So, I mean, they're in a very, very good situation. I think we're comfortable with the schedule going forward. So like maybe just everybody take a deep breath, see where we're at. It's a good spot to be in, especially, uh, you know, kind of seeing the, the haves and have nots that are the NFC. There's not a lot of middle ground. So I think for the Packers, they're in a very comfortable position as long as they can right the ship. Yeah, and I mean, I think that is really the contrast between this season and last season. Last season, they were three and six, and we were so frustrated because it felt like they were losing games they should have won, and they just couldn't kind of finish games and had some clunkers to to get them started in, in the beginning of that season. And this season is frustrating for a different reason, and it's because Perry said, you know, last season we didn't have expectations. We all joked this was the first year we were going in not expecting to win a Super Bowl in like 20 years as Green Bay fans, and that was just... You know, we were like, oh, okay, like this isn't a great record, but you're you're trying to see what you have in Jordan Love. Is he the guy? You know, it's your first year without Aaron Rodgers. What's all this going to look like this season? Like you said, you almost get to the, the NFC Championship game. You know, you're a couple missed kicks away from that, and then you have a really good draft. You bring in the some of the best free agents out there. You get a new defensive coordinator finally, and the expectation is the moon. Like you expect the Super Bowl to be the 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 end game. So I do agree with you both. I think you made some really good points that they certainly can clean things up down the stretch, but that's, you know, when you're talking about 12 and five, absolutely a great record would take that in a heartbeat going into the season. But I think that's when it gets frustrating when you look and see that they lost to Philly by five, they lost to the Vikings by two, they left 10 points on the board against the lions. Like those kinds of self-inflicted wounds add up and they could be to Andrew, to your point, the difference between like, the fifth seed or the seventh seed if the rest of the NFC kind of catches up. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's true. And again, this is we're all saying this is a big if. There are things this team needs to clean up. They need to stop with the penalties, right? They need to stop. They need to get better in the red zone um, are the two that come to mind, right? They need to figure out a little bit now what's going on with their pass rush because they haven't been able to get to the quarterback as effectively as I think we all would hope that they would. So they have things to do. This offense is not clicking nearly as much as you would expect it to. Now, again, part of that could be Jordan is not himself and he's hurt. I don't know. Um, but I have confidence that those things will get cleaned up. They are not institutional problems. They are fixable issues. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess maybe if we want to shift gears a little bit, I'd be curious to hear because I think we probably all have some examples of this players that are exceeding expectations and players that are not meeting expectations, because I think there's, you know, there's some obvious ones, but we might have different perspectives on who some of those, those tweeners would be. So Andrew, I'm going to put you on the spot and let you go first. <laughs> oh, great. Not prepared. Yeah. I, I think, I think for a rookie linebacker, my expectations are nearly zero. Um, and that is like, because of just the history of the NFL rookie linebackers just don't come in and make an impact. And so even though I think he's been, been allowed to play as more of a specialist, Edrin Cooper has been so impressive. Like I loved him in the draft, but like I did not think he would come along this quickly. And so to see the difference between where he's at right now and like even where Quay, at, Quay is at in year three, like it's night and day. And so that gives me a ton of hope because to have that super athletic linebacker who also is showing really early instincts is so valuable to this team. Also a special shout out. I've always really liked Eric Wilson. Um, and if the Packers had beaten the 49ers last year, we would talk about Eric Wilson probably in the way that we talk about like Jarrett Bush with the like Super Bowl interception, <laughs> Eric Wilson scooping the fumble, the Keyshawn Nixon fumble off the turf is so incredible. And we never talk about it because they lost. But the, the way he has played to go from like a career special teamer kind of guy to just like a, so solid. And that that is such a big deal in this defense to have linebackers who can get guys on the ground. I know we're coming off the Detroit game, so <laughs> nobody tackle well. But like overall, I, I think that those two are, are players that I have been incredibly impressed with and have really helped to take this defense to the next level. Um also, just side note, uh, there was a lot of talk of like th there's there's some statistical significance to like teams who play Detroit losing the game after Detroit. They, they jokingly refer to it as the Honolulu flu. Um, <laughs> and the Packers don't have to play anybody this week. So that actually might like the timing of the bye week might be really good because that physicality of the Detroit team has had some really, really weird impacts on other NFL teams. It sounds like instead you both got the Honolulu flu. But so thank you for taking that for the Packers. I really feel like it. <laughs> so they Happy to lay on the couch for them. Happy to take <laughs> one for the team. Um, I think a lot of guys come to mind and I love, I love those choices. Um, for when you asked this question, Maggie, the first one was Tucker Craft. It was the first name that popped into my head. And yeah. and I know that the expectations were already high, but to have someone come in, play a hundred percent of snaps, be one of the best tight ends in the league and for in terms of yards after a catch, like is always in on every major play. I think I I think Maggie and I talked about this in our recap show, but I'm almost the drop that he had in the Detroit game was the first drop that I can actually remember him having in weeks, maybe at all this season. He's so reliable. And again, you talked about it for linebackers. I think on the flip side, on the offensive side of the ball, tight end is so hard to acclimate to the NFL. And we're definitely seeing some younger like rookie and second year tight ends, like make that transition a little bit easier the last few seasons. And I think that's probably a testament to where college football is right now. But Tucker Craft came from a really small program, like a really small program. And according to anyone that was there, he looked lost in his first, you know, NFL off season. So I've just been so impressed with him. And I, I legitimately say like, if something good is happening on offense is because Tucker Graff was involved. Um, my other shout out, 
uh, is Xavier McKinney. And it's an obvious one, but, you know, not always when you bring in, you know, that big name, big money free agent signing, are they actually going to pan out? Right. And I a little bit was worried, like, oh, the Packers finally made that splash signing. And like, what if he sucks? Like, <laughs> what if we're all like so excited? And then he comes in and he's not living up. No, he's everything and more. Um, obviously leads leads the team in turnovers. Um, I don't think Jared Goff even like tried to look his way in this game. He's just changing the way offenses are playing this defense single-handedly um, and attempting to make life easier for the rest of the secondary. I think we can get to that um, in a bit, but just everything that they wanted uh, in, in the big money, like big name signing, which again, like, it doesn't always happen, especially when you're entering into a new scheme with a new defensive coordinator. Can yeah. I say this really quick to the Tucker Kraft point? You you actually jogged my memory here. I think even coming into the season, we expected to jump from Kraft, but everybody was all in on Luke Musgrave. And yeah. unfortunately, like injury has derailed his season. But for Kraft to step up, not only from year one to year two, but then also like really being the sole focus of that tight end room. Um, that has been made that even more impressive. That's that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, we thought, right, you'd have like a dynamic one-two tandem at tight end. And unfortunately, with Luke Musgrave getting hurt, it's been all Tucker Craft, and he could have, you know, risen to the occasion like he did, or it could have been a ton of pressure. And then we're talking about the Packers needing something from any of their tight ends. And thankfully, that hasn't been the case. Um, one of the guys that I don't know if it's it counts as exceeding expectations, but uh, Perry and I had been pretty adamant after last season that Jaden Reed was going to be wide receiver one on this offense. And just a quick note about what his numbers look like. He finished the season with 793 yards. He's already got 620 yards through the first nine games of the season on pace for just shy of 1200 yards to finish out the year. And, you know, I think there's, there's certain moments, you know, that we're seeing guys like, you know, Dontavian Wicks get some drops and just you'd want more development maybe from the rest of the room, but when Reed gets the opportunities that are in front of him, Perry and I talked about it. He had like a really quiet over 100 yard game against Detroit that I think we all forgot he had over 100 yards. Cause it's just like steady as he goes, like he's just kind of in the offense and making the big plays when they're needed. So I don't know if you can call it exceeding expectations because it's what we expected him to be able to do, but certainly deserving of praise for the, the reliability that he brings to the offense. So Maybe that's my flipped point is that the rest of the receiving room is not meeting the expectations that I think we had set for them in the beginning of the season. Just thinking that this room was so loaded and how many receivers are they going to keep and who is going to be the surprise cut. And they have seven quality starting wide receivers in that room that are all fighting for playing time. And I do really like their receiving core. I think it's a really great group, but we have seen them struggle at times, especially against Detroit last week, which the rain didn't help with some of that, but some reliability out of that unit, I think would be really nice. And that's where Reed comes in. Yeah. Do you think, and this is just a question I don't have an answer to. So I'm throwing it out there as like a live discussion point. Do you think the, and I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase it. I mentioned earlier, like how good this rushing attack is with Josh Jacobs and Maggie, you said like the whole room right now, it'll be interesting to see how Marshawn Lloyd factors in when he comes off IR, but like the Packers have never had this. They've never had a guy who they can really like, who puts the offense on their back if need be. And I'm wondering if something about leaning on the rush game, where when you do have this many weapons to throw to is maybe throwing off like the rhythm that we saw in the offense last season. That was like, so pass heavy. Yeah. I, I definitely think that that is a factor. There's only so many reps. And then for a young player to know I'm only going to get two targets, maybe three during this whole game. I can't screw this up. I think that leads to a lot of drops. I, I really do. I think there's something to, to be said about the momentum of getting somebody involved in the game. And for the Packers, they just don't have that luxury. They're going to rely on the run game. So Christian Watson might only get two or three targets and they're going to be big ones and he met, better make the most of it. Um, and, and so that, that pressure is tough to deal with. And I think it's hard to just like get into the natural rhythm of the game when you're constantly going in and out. I will say 
no matter what, I so appreciate the Packers young receivers and their willingness to do the dirty work in the mm -hmm. blocking game, because without that, this run game doesn't work. They mm -hmm. probably wouldn't be six and three. Um, and so despite all of that, I, I think, I think they're still contributing in a really, really important way that that's one of the things that gives me a lot of optimism down the stretch. I think they can get that going. Um, and play, not playing in a monsoon will, <laughs> will help like some of these things to, to correct themselves. And I, I, I think it's a, it's a good learning experience to sort of get manhandled by Detroit. And I, I think, I think the receivers will naturally sort of continue to progress as the season goes along. Yeah. Last season, to your point, Perry, the Packers are 28th in rushing yards. So certainly a complete 180 there uh, when it comes to the production in the ground game. But something else I want to touch on really quickly before we maybe shift over to the defensive side of the ball. But thoughts on the offensive line so far and how that's looked. I know Josh Meyer is getting injured, you know, probably threw a wrench in things going into the Detroit game. But how are the like the tackles meeting your expectations? The 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 alignment as a whole. I know Sean Ryan and Jordan Morgan were kind of rotating for a while. And then you have Jordan Morgan shifting to left guard because Josh Myers is out and Elton has to move to center. Like what do we feel about this offensive line just through the first, first half of the season? First of all, I'm really over the Elton Jenkins snapping experience. <laughs> uh, that had me going to flashbacks of some of the centers I've scouted for the draft who like couldn't snap. Uh, like every snap was low on Sunday and uh, I think it was causing a lot of problems, but uh, overall, like, I, I don't know how much more positive I can be about the Packers ability to continue to develop young offensive linemen. Like it's, it's yeah. absurd. We, we, we jokingly get to talk about how great our quarterbacks have been for the last 30 years. And that's awesome. But like the, these offensive lines just keep coming out of nowhere. Uh, you know, it's nobody in the NFL has a reliable seventh round left tackle. And here the Packers are like they just got done with a generational fourth round left tackle. And now they're going to plug in a seventh rounder. And like, yeah, Rashid hasn't been awesome in the run game. But like if you can protect Jordan Love's blind side, I'm happy with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Zach Tom has been amazing. I think in the procedural penalties have to go away. There's no way this team can progress in the playoffs with those mistakes playoff football teams are not going to let you get away with that Detroit just showed you so you clean that up I think you have a lot of positive things to work with and the Packers have a luxury that very few teams across the league have and that is just a little bit of depth right not a lot but the the fact that they could go out and have a serviceable five when you're starting center is suddenly ruled out um I I think is is really good so um, I'm not going to complain because I watch a lot of other teams across the league and <laughs> oh boy, there are some bad offensive lines. Yeah. Um, I could not agree more. I think like their one knock is the penalties, which is a legitimate and, you know, knock and problem that they need to clean up. Right. But like for the most part, I, you, I don't think about the offensive line when we go into a game, right? Which is, yeah. I think, how it should be. Like, I'm not worried that some there's a liability on the line. I'm never worried about Jordan Love's blind side. I'm not worried about the run game because they're they're blocking up nice holes for Josh Jacobs. It also helps they have someone who creates out of nothing. But they are doing good things like 90% of the time. And if they can just not back themselves up, in key moments, they would be perfect. Um, I love seeing Jordan Morgan in, and I think he's going to be a great offensive lineman. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing how they work him in because I thought he did some, other than the one penalty he had, he did some awesome things in that game. And just, again, the fact that you have a, you know, a rookie who hasn't played, he's played, but hasn't started until week nine and you plug him in not really at his natural position either because he's been rotating in on the other side. So he's flipping, you know, everything about his stance and his hands. And he looks like that. It's just a testament to what the Packers do in that room. Like they just, to your point, Andrew, they just churn them out. Um, so I'm actually like more pleasantly surprised about the line than I was in the off season. Cause we had a lot of question marks about who yeah. was going to go where and what the best five was going to look like. And they actually have multiple best fives. Yeah, 
I think that's a good point. They have multiple options, and we know Josh Myers is in a contract year. That is going to be a narrative that we hear probably coming down the stretch and right when the offseason begins, factored in potentially to why they took a guy like Jacob Monk on day three of the draft last season. But all right, let's shift a little bit. It doesn't have to be players that met or didn't meet expectations, but just looking at the defense in general. We we said at the top of the show before the trade deadline, we thought maybe the Packers could make a move at corner or at edge. Instead, they traded away an edge rusher. Um, so what does the defense look like down the stretch? They already have exceeded their turnover totals from last season, their interception totals. You know, they have a, an incredible turnover differential. Even when the offense has given them away, the defense has taken them back. Last couple weeks have not been as good um, as far as, you know, generating turnovers, but multiple games, almost all of them. Yeah, seven of nine games this year with two or more turnovers. So. Mm-hmm. Is Jeff Halfley meeting expectations? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the one thing that I, I I love that he can generate pressure when the defense isn't creating pressure. And we, yep. we've seen this for years and years and years. One of the things we complained about with the Packers defense is they were so reliant on getting a pass rush with just their front four creating and and they weren't always able to. Um, and so far this year, their front four have not been able to create pressure on their own, but Halfley has created that through his scheme. And that's what the best defensive coordinators do. So I've been ultra impressed with him. I think the thing that I'm watching now that Preston is gone is who is going to ascend into that pass rusher opposite of Rashawn Gary. And obviously we need Gary to play better. But is that going to be Kingsley and Ibarre, a guy I absolutely loved in the draft, who's kind of come along slowly. We've seen big flashes, but not the consistency yet. Or is it going to be Lucas Van Ness, who is now at that point in his career where he has the opportunity to make that huge leap from like a, a fun athlete to a dominating pass rush specialist. And I think about like High Smith with the Steelers right now, Preston's going to go be, be the the third guy in that rotation. But like Highsmith came on and it has made TJ Watt unblockable because you can't, you can't double Watt on every play because you have a really great pass rusher on the other side. Can LVN step up, take some of that pressure off of Rashawn Gary. And I was on your show right after the draft when the Packers took LVN and Perry had to talk me off the cliff because I did not like the pick. Jackson Smith and Jigba had a great game this past week, by the way. Anyways, I th- this is an opportunity for Perry to like spike the football in my face because I think Lucas Van Ness has an opportunity to be huge down the stretch and really change the trajectory of this season. Perry, would you like that opportunity? <laughs> you mean dunking on Andrew? Oh, yeah. oh anytime, any moment. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. You should see our uh, fantasy football DMs. It's just yeah. hate, hate, hate. Um, <laughs> no, I joke. Uh, it's all in good fun. Um, no, I agree with you. I think that like this, they must feel confident that he can also ascend to that player if they made that yeah. move. Because, and I agree. I mean, I, I, I agree. We haven't seen results, but there's. And there's, I have not, I have nothing but my eyes watching the games to back up what I'm about to say, but it's just watching him in this new defense, like the opposite of Preston Smith, right? Preston Smith doesn't fit this scheme. LVN does. He fits this scheme, right? It's almost like it's a repeat of his rookie season because he's having to relearn everything. So it's, it's week nine. He is still a little bit of a, unrefined unfinished product but he's getting there you can see it clicking you can see him starting to like meet guys in the backfield you can see the pressures and the QB hits starting to stack up so I think the stats are going to come and I could not agree more as a defense as a whole I've been really impressed I like the play style I like the aggression I think it's exactly what we were expecting I just wish that the Packers had more aggressive corners to match what Jeff Halfley is doing because Ja in this scheme is everything we hoped for, but he's been missing a ton of games, unfortunately. And when he's out Stokes and Valentine just like don't have it. And it's unfortunate because I thought Valentine had a great season last year and you really hoped for that second year jump. And you were really hopeful for Stokes to come back from his injury and, you know, put something together, but I'm not seeing it. So if there was one weak link 
for me in this defense so far, it's that. And that's a player issue, not a scheme issue. I think you plug in, um, you know, just a more talented, unfortunately, player at boundary corner and and you're good to go. I also don't think Nixon is that guy either, but here we are with Nixon on the boundary. But they're making do, right? They're still holding opposing offenses to point differentials where they're off the Packers offense should be able to beat them. They are still turning the ball over at an exceptionally high rate. Like they're doing great things, even when things aren't perfect. And that's again, a testament to the defensive coordinator. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, the secondary conversations, it took a hit because Jair is hurt. Evan Williams is hurt. We saw the difference that a rookie Evan Williams, he probably gets an exceeds oh. expectations ball from earlier in the show. Um, just the impact that he's made as a day three guy to come in and take over opposite, you know, the premier signing of free agency and play like he belongs right there with him because he does. And I, I think to Perry's point, the best five is Jair and Nixon on the boundary, Javon Bullard in the slot, and then Williams and McKinney deep. And unfortunately, they were missing two of those guys against a really talented Detroit offense. So certainly just not going to look great when you have the the corners that you do on the field. But I think for me, and I don't know if we, you know, it the maybe the challenge that we're seeing from this defense is just the, the D-line we talked about it as being like the most solidified position on this roster in training camp. And, you know, there was no way that they were going to be able to carry extra bodies. And we were really impressed and intrigued by the rotation that they had with Kenny Clark and TJ Slayton and Devonte Wyatt, who had played really well before his injury. Um, Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden, like that's your five. And the, the production just has, I mean, Kenny's had like the quietest season we've ever seen from him, which is so weird to say about Kenny Clark. And hopefully it's November now. We'll see Mr. December soon and things will start heating up for the defense. But I think when we talk about the creativity of the pass rush and, you know, finding ways for Halfley to generate pressure when the rush isn't getting home, a lot of it starts with that front. And thankfully the the guys like Edge Cooper are athletic enough to make up for that. Eric Wilson, like you mentioned, but yeah, I think the disappointment for me on this defense is is the D-line. Yeah, and it's it's both like generating any interior pressure in the pass rush and then also their struggle to stop the run. Uh, for me, if there's anybody that's been a little disappointing, it's actually been Jair Alexander. I mean, his, it, like I, I just feel like over the last three years, his availability has been very low and um for the packers this is a guy you're paying now he's technically the second highest paid corner in the league but you paid him as the highest paid corner in the league and that that contract was far enough out of number two that it stuck for a while the way contracts typically don't in the nfl and you need him to be on the field and i know injuries are not a player's fault and i'm not blaming him but the disappointment has been having to play this defense with Keyshawn Nixon and Carrington Valentine or Eric Stokes on the perimeter. And it's just not the same. It's not working as well. I think if Jair can take the bye week really like get healthy and find a way to take care of his body to get through the playoffs, I think that gives the Packers a, an advantage they simply don't have. Because if you can have Jair covering an Amon Ross St. Brown, you don't have to focus so much energy on him and you can let your other players really focus on those other weapons that the Lions have. And that that's going to be true across the NFC. You see the top teams all have really great wide receiver play. So we need our corner, who's one of the best corners in the league, to be available. Um, again, not a, not a like blame, but like I, I think that's something that um, will be really important factor success going forward. No, it's so true. Um, like he he's a game changer when he's on the field. Like yeah. just like I said, you know, with Xavier McKinney um, changing the way offenses play this defense, like Jair is that same player. Um, and without him, the defense has to change the way they play offenses and the offenses – see weak links like they see places that they can exploit on the field and that's not what you want um and and i hear you that like it's not a you know you know he doesn't want to be hurt you know he wants to be out there it's not it's not necessarily a blame thing but in general you want your best corner to be as available as often as possible yeah 
All right. Yeah, big time. And I think I think that's that's one of the issues. Sorry, Maggie. I didn't mean to no, you're... Off, but like <laughs> that, that's one of the issues with having a more diminutive player. Like Jair plays big, but he's physically limited by the size of his body. That that's not a judgmental call. Like the fact that he is an elite NFL player is amazing. It it shows the talent, the desire to improve in his craft, the ability, like the passion, all of those things. It's just that like he does tend to get dinged up a little bit and that happens with some players. So hopefully, hopefully the Packers can, can figure that out. And we, we see a really healthy Jair down the stretch. Cause I think the Packers defense could be like crazy, crazy good. Yeah. And they're going to need to be crazy, crazy good against some of the offenses that they would potentially see in the playoffs. I know a lot of, a lot of ball game left, but uh, if the season were to end today, they would be heading to the commanders in round one. So that would be, you know, a very interesting uh, wild card weekend for them, but all right, we're pushing 40 minutes, which is great. We love, love this conversation, Andrew, but anyone have any, any thoughts that we didn't touch on yet in the show that they want to mention before we wrap this one up, whether it's about this season, how it compares to last season, thoughts coming out of the bye week. Guess I will just first. say this. <laughs> I, I think I think coming out of this game, rightfully so, from a national perspective, the Lions should be the Super Bowl favorite. And I say that even though Kansas City is undefeated. But there's a lot of weaknesses to that team and depth is my number one. They, they, they cannot afford injuries almost across the board, wide receiver, offensive line. They have some really thin positions on defense. Um, they're over relying on their safeties because their corners aren't very good. And they, that's a team that I think could potentially have some issues down the stretch for Detroit. They better win the the Super Bowl this year because I have a feeling they're going to lose both their coordinators this offseason. The salary cap is going to start to become an issue because they're paying everybody, deservedly so, very talented team. Um, that That's a fascinating footnote from like a national perspective is like how the Lions are, are going to perform down the stretch. So I, I, I'm excited to see how they do with a whole bunch of pressure suddenly on their shoulders. Hmm. Pressure is real. Like we talked about at the top of the show and I think it's where I'm going to wrap us. And Maggie, I also want your thoughts because you always host and I want your, your <laughs> bi-week thoughts as well. But I mean, like there were expectations on this Packers team going into the season and they were um, absolutely deserved expectations. Like we mentioned at this point last season, we were looking at a three and six team and we had no idea in which direction they were going to take that season it could have gone a myriad of different ways. And instead they took it and they ran with it and they became who we know today, which is a team that we expect to make a Super Bowl push in year two of Jordan Love, which is an incredible feat just to like take a step back and like have some perspective on like where this still very, very, very young team is at. It's not making any excuses for the mistakes that they're making because they shouldn't be making them and they're really just beating themselves. But it's also to say that like the expectations are there because of what they showed last season. They're not showing us the same thing this season, but there's so much potential still. And that's why I stay optimistic for what's going to happen post bye week because they are just beating themselves. They're still coming out of games on the right side of beating bad teams. They unfortunately were on the wrong side of losing to a very good team, to your boy Andrew, potentially going to the Super Bowl, the favorite. Um, and their only other like bad, bad loss, they still came out almost beating the Minnesota Vikings. I don't count week one because that was just like kind of an anomaly. So the ball bounce either way is starting, is going in their favor this season. So they have everything in their power to um, fill in some of the gaps that are causing them to keep these games close and or lose to you know opponents that they should and could be. So I see the rest of the season as something that they can you know take in their grasp and like run with. And they proved last season that that's something they can do in a much worse position. Um, so I'm excited for the rest of the season, but it have, they just got to right the ship a little bit. Yeah. And I, and I think to your point, you know, you said 
pressure is real and you can rise to that occasion or you can, you know, kind of let it frame the rest of the season. And I think what we've seen from the locker room and the character and we talked in the off season before the, the season had even started that we had not seen a locker room like this in a long time the tight knit nature, you know, they liked being underdogs. They liked feeling like the odds were stacked against them. And the pressure's on now, like you said, the Lions, the Vikings, Packers are third in their division and still right in the thick of things in the playoff race. And I think that's, that's kind of where they want to be as much as you want to, you want the home playoff game. We would love for them to have a home playoff game. They didn't need one last season. And they, you know, they won some of their biggest moments at Ford field on Thanksgiving. They were, like we said earlier, missed missed opportunities away from making it to the championship game. And I think this is a, a better football team than last season. And I think expectations should still be sky high. It's just making sure that they clean up what they need to clean up because I think they've proven week in and week out, they really are the team beating themselves. And I know that doesn't count in the wins and loss column. A loss is a loss still regardless, but if they don't, or if they get out of their own way, I'm not sure that there's a team that can hang with them at full strength, period. So I think that's that's the optimistic take that we'll end the show on, right? As we all feel very good about this team still, it's just a matter of can they put it together? And we all say yes. So there, there's your bye week heading into the, the last half of the season. And uh, like Perry said, sorry, Bears, it's, it's not going to be a good one in, yeah. in week 11. All right. Yeah. That's all we got. All she Love wrote. It. Yeah. All right, Andrew. I told you it was going to be optimistic. So, <laughs> Andrew, thank you so, so much for joining us. Please let the people know where they can find all of your work. And unfortunately, you're stuck with me for a lot of that work as well. <laughs> yeah, always my pleasure to, <laughs> to be asked to be on. I You, you can find me on the Friday Packadays. Um, and also uh, Kyle Fellows and I do a podcast called The Draft Fellows where we just talk about uh, NFL draft stuff. Uh, and and really like roster building as a whole. Like this week, we're going to dive into the New Orleans Saints and sort of like how they're going to get out of the monumental cap space hole that they're in right now. So uh, just some fun stuff. So if you like nerding out about roster building and NFL draft stuff, uh, come check us out. Yes, always really good work. Love listening to the draft fellows, especially as draft season is going to start ramping up here. Feels crazy that we're already in November, only a couple months left of actual NFL football, and then we'll be diving into college players that nobody had heard of a couple months ago, because that's what we do when we love football as much as we do. But thank you, as always, for listening to the show. This has been the Pax That She Said podcast. You can find it on Twitter at PWSS podcast, Perry at Perry underscore Goldstein, me at Maggie J. Loney. If you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe to the show if you don't already. We appreciate it. If you're listening on Spotify, consider supporting the show if you love what we do, or just consider subscribing on any of the audio platforms that you listen to. And we'll be back next week to preview the Packers Bears. But until then, enjoy the bye, rest up, and go Pack Go! Go Pack Go!